Hey guys, this is our last video lecture for the civil rights union on notes number five. So let's get into it. Um, end of civil rights movement is the title of notes number five. Uh, so let's do a little recap up to this point. Um, the civil rights movement began with a push with different causes. Brown versus Board of Education is going to be a movement to end the unequal access that African American kids had to education. The Supreme Court ruled that education must be given. Uh, equal status to both sides so that black kids and white kids should go to school together. Um, there was another fight on equality in terms of being on transportation with Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott and the Supreme Court also ruled that it was unconstitutional to make uh, African Americans go sit on the back of the bus. So that's another victory. We talked about the sit-ins with the Student Nonviolent Recording Committee where they sat there peacefully and then those got desegregated. And then we men I mentioned that um, they felt that they couldn't go cause by cause by cause anymore because how long would this movement take if we had to fight against, uh, uh, have a protest movement uh, for bathrooms and another protest movement for hospitals and another one for, and another one and another one. And they decided to go all in, all in one city. And they chose Birmingham, Alabama because it was the most segregated city in the South. And to, through tons of violence and their peaceful demonstration, they are going to end the segregation in Birmingham. After that, their big push went to, we need to go through the whole country and only Congress could do that, so we gotta go to Washington. And there was a big protest in Washington. They expected about 100,000, 250,000 people showed up. Um, and this is where uh, Martin Luther gave, gave his famous, I have a dream speech. And it takes about a year, but eventually the Civil Rights Movement, a Civil Rights Act of 1964 would pass. Well, it will end discrimination based on race, sex, national origin, or religion. So huge, huge victory for equality across the country. The next fight was um, getting the voting rights. So this, there was a Selma campaign, and ultimately it's going to be a big push. The 24th Amendment ends poll tax, and the Voting Rights Act of 65 ends literacy tests. So two huge victories. And at this point, um, segregation... It, it, the jury segregation, which is established by law, is pretty much gone. All right, the laws that segregated people are gone. The problem is that you still have de facto. And de facto segregation is when people are separated, not because there's a law, like the juror says, but because it's the culture of the location. And that's going to take a long, long time. It is way harder to fight de facto segregation because you got to change people's minds. How do you change the mind of somebody who is 35 years old, was born in a culture that told him that he was superior, and now um, are, are you're telling him that he is equal to everybody else? How do you change somebody who's been in the KKK all their life and just tell them, yep, now you got to think that African Americans should be able to eat with you, live with you, go to school with your children. That's going to be a very, very long fight that we're still fighting today. So the big push of the civil rights movement is let's get rid of the law. So you can't get arrested for doing these things. And the push from this point forward will be um, to let's fight the culture. Now, across the country, violence is going to erupt from civil rights groups. I mean, from African-Americans, white people didn't understand this. For white people, their attitude is, hey, you guys fought the civil rights movement. You did it the right way. You had nonviolent protests. You didn't fight back. You didn't use violence. And you won Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights 65, 24th Amendment. These are three great victories. Hooray, the civil rights movement is done. For African Americans, their attitude is, what the hell are you talking about? The civil rights movement is not done. We are not equal. We still have the jury, I mean, de facto, this damn culture of segregation that we got to fight. So, yeah, there's no more laws that says that we can't sit on the front of the bus. But if I try to sit on front of the bus in some of these cities, they're going to beat me down until I move to the back. And that's it's not over yet. And for a lot of uh, white people, their attitude is we helped you. We were part of the, the uh, Freedom Riders. We did our part. We supported you. We called Congress. We did our part. We helped you. And they couldn't understand why African-Americans were so angry. A couple of examples of how bad it got was one in Harlem. It started as a peaceful protest by court, remember black and white members of Congress of Racial Equality, and it ended up turning into a two-day violent protest. Why? They were protesting because a 15-year-old kid had basically been beaten to death by cops. And that's something that happened a lot. So when they're peacefully protesting, guess who shows up? Of course, it's the police. 
and it turns violent and ends with 500 people being injured at this uh, two-day riot. So for two days, you could not be on the street. Chaos, no law, and all kinds of laws being broken. 500 arrested and about a million's worth of property damage. A million dollars worth of property damage in 1964 is a lot of money. That's a lot of damage. But this riot, compared to this one right here, the Watts riot in 1965 was nothing. Harlem riots was in New York. Harlem is one of the boroughs of New York. Watt is right here in LA, south of Los Angeles. Um, and this one lasted for six days. 34 people were killed. 1,000 people were injured. 4,000 arrested and $40 million worth of property damage. Why $40 million worth of property damage? Because basically it was a war zone. It looked like this. It looked like out of a movie, like bombs had been dropped on this little city in Watts. People jumped to the streets, as you can see here. Um, I lost the picture. As you can see in these pictures, Look at the utter destruction of buildings being burned, uh, factories being destroyed. And when the fire department would come to these, uh, to try to put this out, they couldn't because people would shoot at the fire department, shoot at the police, and basically made the police and the fire department not go to Watts. And that's why it lasted for six years, I mean, six days of horror. If you lived in Watts, you were scared for those six days. Ultimately, how did they get it back? They brought in the military, the National Guard, the state military came in and they're forcibly going to eventually get it back. But this is what basically Watts was left of. Why was there so much anger? Again, going back to this idea that white people felt that, why are you angry? You won. You won the civil rights movement. You did all this nonviolent protest. Why are you getting violent now? Um, so President Johnson, who had helped pass the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights of 65, the 24th Amendment, considered a civil rights president, he could understood, understand why. And he, it's true, he's white too. He was rich from the South, so he could understand what it is to be an African American um, and go through life being looked at differently all the time. So he thought, I need to do an investigation. So he does something called the Kerner Commission, all right? The Kerner Commission's attitude is that it's 11 members set up of different people from across the country, and their job is investigate. Go check out what the cultures of the country looks like, all kinds of parts, of, different parts of the culture, especially in the South, and come back and tell me, are these African Americans right? Should they really be angry? And the results basically say, yeah, there is way too much racism still. Yes, the laws are gone, the segregated people, but that culture is still there, and it's still making the lives of African Americans very difficult. So they suggested a couple things. One, let's integrate all white communities. Let's let black people live in white communities, good, solid white communities. If that happens, then they're also able to go to the schools of those white communities, therefore go to better schools. Let's get African-Americans opportunities and better jobs, not just getting a job like sweeping the floors at a factory. Let's see if we could make them into management where they could get more money, live in better neighborhoods, send their kids to college, those kind of things will end up making it easier for them to be equal in this country. Essentially, Johnson did nothing. Why would he make this Kerner Commission and then ignore their, their results? Because honestly, he needed a lot of those people in the South. Those people in the South were primarily Democrat. And even though the Democrats were, the Democratic Party was changing, where Democrats were the party of civil rights, it started with John F. Kennedy, Democratic president, uh, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, the one we're talking about now, Democratic president, the voters in the South were still primarily Democrat, and he needed them for the next election. So he basically said, we've done a lot. We'll get back to this. All right. So new leaders will emerge across the country. One of those very famous leaders is Malcolm X. Malcolm X was an African-American who is going to have a very hard life, who's going to end up in prison. And while in prison, he's going to learn about the black Muslims. All right, uh, part of the Muslim race, I mean, Muslim religion, where it concentrated on what's best for African Americans. And it was led by a man named Elijah Muhammad. So this is Malcolm X right here. All right, so he, again, really, really hard uh, life that he grew up with. His uh, dad was a minister who he preached against the KKK. He tried to get African Americans to stand up and get their rights against the KKK. The KKK kept on warning him that they were going to kill him, and eventually they did. How? 
They tied him to the train tracks. They took Malcolm X's dad, tied his arms, tied his legs, and let a train run over him. Worst part is, um, his dad kind of knew that he was going to die, so he took out a life insurance, which is what um, gives your family money if something happens to you. And that way, Malcolm and his brothers and his mom would be taken care of. Well, with the discrimination and racism of the South, they ruled that Malcolm's dad had actually committed suicide. And if you commit suicide, you don't get to collect any money or life insurance because you took your own life. So how did Malcolm X, his dad, tie his legs and his arms and commit suicide? Never explained. But their attitude is he committed suicide. We don't give you anything. And it led to his mom, who had a lot of kids, including Malcolm, to kind of go crazy. Another reason why she went crazy is because her mom, Malcolm's grandma, was actually raped by a white person. So... Uh, she was already she already grew up in a culture the mom where her mom was raped by a white person and she had white kind of whitish skin and she hated her skin so that's why when she married Malcolm's dad the minister who was who was killed he had really dark skin because she wanted her children to have dark skin so this is where Malcolm X is at he's a little kid his mom is in a, is sent to an insane asylum because she goes crazy and his dad is is killed by the KKK he grows up he's into crime. Eventually, he gets caught and he's thrown in jail. And when in jail is when he starts meeting, learning about Elijah Muhammad, right? This is Elijah Muhammad. He's the leader of the black Muslims. And what he preaches is, we, in order to get equality, we got to separate from white people. So just like how we talked about separate but equal, that's, he preached the same thing. But his attitude is, but it has to be equal. History taught us that separate but equal was separate but never equal. African Americans always got the worst end of it. White people always got the nicer things, the nicer locations. And what Elijah Muhammad preached was we need to separate because the white people are the devils. And since they're the devils, we can't live with them. So we have to live away from them. But where we live and where they live have to be equal. So he said, if you have to use violence in order to get that equality, then that's what you got to do. And Malcolm X is going to preach the same thing. Now, Malcolm X is actually the one who's going to grow this religion, because when he found this religion, it was centered in one city, Detroit, Michigan. And in a few years, Malcolm X was very charismatic, knows how to speak, great at giving speeches, is going to travel across the country, and he's going to turn this little religion from one city into a national religion where there are members of the black Muslims all over the country. And then the problems start. And it starts because Elijah Muhammad here, he, um, he is jealous of Malcolm X, because Malcolm X was the one who went across the country. Everybody thought Malcolm X was the leader. So when you ask people who's the leader of the black Muslims, they said Malcolm X, not Elijah Muhammad. So he started doing things to kind of punish Malcolm and take some power away from him. And Malcolm X didn't help himself either, because when uh, John F. Kennedy was killed, he's going to give a quote where he basically says he deserved it. Why did John F. Kennedy deserve it? Because white people are the devils, they're racist, they destroy people. So this is just one of those consequences that you have for being so evil. And for that reason, Elijah Muhammad is going to, because people got mad, they were angry at Malcolm X for saying something like that. So he's going to suspend him. And when he suspends him, he decides to do something that every Muslim has to do. It's called the pilgrimage to Mecca. And this is kind of, it's a big, huge ceremony where you go and you're supposed to dress in white, which basically means that, you go from, doesn't matter who, what person you are, if you're rich or poor, you dress in all white, and they have a big ceremony where these people end up moving around, crawling on their knees at times, and they're supposed to basically tell you that you're all one people, that it doesn't matter who you are outside of this place, as a Muslim, you're equal. And when he went there, he, 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 uh, when he did the pilgrimage, he had religious studies with white people, Asian people, Hispanic people, and he realized that what Elijah Muhammad said, that white people are the devil, was wrong that there are good white people. So when he came back, he preached something different. And Elijah Muhammad did not like this new message of some white people are good because Elijah Muhammad said they're all evil. So Malcolm X is going to leave the church, but people still thought he was a leader. And Elijah Muhammad is going to order the death of um, Malcolm X. So Malcolm X is going to be assassinated as well, but he will not be assassinated by a white tra racist. He will be assassinated by the leaders uh, the followers of Elijah Muhammad and the black Muslims. And in February of 1965, while giving a speech in Harlem, Malcolm X will be shot and killed right in front of his family. Um, another group that's going to emerge that's going to show this anger, this new erupt anger, is the Black Panthers. It's a political party founded by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, and their attitude is, we got to show people how great being black is. 
We got to show them some self-defense. Black power. We have power if we come together. Self-defense. Protect yourself. African-American pride. That we should be proud of being African-Americans. That black is beautiful. And this one was the one that got them into trouble. Violence when necessary. That if you have to, go ahead and be violent. Martin Luther King said it's always not okay to be violent. This is what the Black Panthers look like. Right? They had uh, the all black, black glasses usually, and then this black beret. Latinos had their own version called the brown berets. And they did the basically the same attitude, but with brown berets. Here's another picture of the black Muslim, I mean, of the Black Panthers. All right, you see again, the leather coats, the berets. The berets are this, these things right here. These are berets. And, if, and in this last picture, you can see that this is what's gonna get up to trouble. They get violent. And the Black Panther Party ends up becoming a party where they cause a lot of violence against the police, even against the FBI, and it becomes targets of the government. And ultimately, the Black Panthers are going to get destroyed by the government. Um, so there's all this anger in the country, and groups like the Black Panthers or people like Malcolm X are going to push. And if you think about it, if you're young and African-American and you lived a short life, but it's always been hard and it's always been racist and discrimination against you, you're going to have some anger inside of you. Martin Luther King, he opposed the Black Power Movement. He said, we can't be fight using violence because if we use violence, then people will not support us. And for white people, if Martin Luther King's attitude is, white people are not going to know the difference between the peaceful protesters and the violent members of the Black Panthers or the followers of Malcolm X. They're all just going to see black people and it's going to take away power from us. Stop with this stuff. More anger is going to erupt in the United States when Dr. King will be assassinated by James Earl Ray. He, um, Malcolm X, I mean, Martin Luther King was not, was a world-renowned leader, but he was not one of those people that wanted the richest of being the leader. Basically, I want the best for the, because I'm the leader. He would go to motels. And one of the places that he liked to, when he went to Memphis, where we get shot and killed, um, he goes to this little motel because he had a little balcony outside the room. And the balcony allowed him to practice his speeches. And while he was practicing his speech on April 3rd, 1968, Dr. King will be assassinated by James Earl Ray. James Earl Ray, a common criminal, somehow becomes a master criminal because he escapes Memphis, he escapes the country, he flies to Europe, he's traveling from place to place in Europe with different passports and money. This guy was in and out of jail for most of his life. Does that sound like somebody who also all of a sudden becomes a uh, almost like an international spy. So they never were able to prove it, but there was always the the fact that somebody was behind this. Somebody put their money and got him away from here. And eventually he will get caught. Well, the reaction to Dr. King's death is anger across the country. And there will be hundreds of little riots popping up all across one city after one city. Cities went up in flames that night because there was so much anger. How could they kill Dr. King? somebody who was about peace. The Civil Rights Act of 1968 will be the last major law passed during the Civil Rights Movement, and this one had to do with housing. This one said that from this point forward, you cannot discriminate uh, against African Americans or any other minority groups when you are hiring, when you are selling or renting a home. This was so important because if you have an all-white high school in an all-white community, and African Americans can move there, then they get to go to that all white high school as well, the good schools, and get a better opportunity for education and better work opportunities. What this led to though is something called white flight. As more, uh, as more um, white pe uh, black people moved into these white communities, white people said, screw this, I'm out. And they left to other white communities that still hadn't been infiltrated by minorities. An example is Harlem, the city where the riot happened. Harlem is one of, we're known, known as one of the most African-American cities in the country, and it used to be an all-white city. As African-Americans moved into Harlem, white people moved out, and eventually became a super, super African-American city. Same thing here in Southern California with Santana. Santana used to be an all-white city. Santana is the capital of Orange County. That's why we have the federal court buildings in Santa Ana. And uh, Santana used to be all-white people. But as Mexican people moved into Santana, white people did the white flight and moved out. They moved out to Anaheim and to other parts. Then Anaheim started having Latinos move in, and they moved out of there and went to Anaheim Hills or Yorba Linda, and down to uh, Irvine and, and Lake Forest and Huntington Beach and um, all these other cities. So why this flight, white flight basically means that as minorities move into communities, white people moved out. All right, so how does this all end? 
by 1970, two thirds, that means two out of every three African Americans, actually could vote. What this meant is a lot more people who are African American got elected into positions of power in the city council, the school board, House of Representatives, the Senate. Basically, they started getting more political power because of voting. But there is still so much more work to do because uh, you still had to change people's attitudes, that de facto segregation was still there. And that is a fight that we're still the fighting, fighting that culture that says that it's okay to be racist, it's okay to be discriminative. We thought we were doing great when we, in 2008, elected a black Af an African-American president in Barack Obama. And then in 2016, we saw how a lot of those people were angry that an African-American had been elected. And that's how we got Donald Trump, who ran on a platform of basic racist, racist ideologies against pretty much everybody. All right. And that's your last of these notes. Thank you.